I am Pritam Rohila, the Executive Director of the Association for Communal Harmony in Asia, also known by its acronym ACHA as ACHA. I'll tell you more about ACHA later. We have just launched our Profiles project. It will highlight life and work of some of the South Asian peace, communal harmony and human rights activists. Nasreen Khan has kindly agreed to edit our videos for this project. For this video entry, I am privileged to introduce to you Shima Karmani. She is an accomplished classical dancer, a renowned theatre artist and a reputed performing arts teacher from Karachi, Pakistan. In spite of repressive government regulations, oppressive social standards and growing fundamentalism and extremism, she is one of the very few who have kept classical dance and performing arts alive in Pakistan. Also for the last several years, she has been using classical dance and performing arts to raise awareness about the plight of women and minorities in Pakistan and to highlight cruel Pakistani traditions which continue to oppress some people. Shima Karmani firmly believes that these art forms allow one to express one's innermost feelings. According to her, they improve the mind, nourish the soul, unleash creativity, give inner strength and have a humanizing influence on people. On the other hand, their absence nurtures intolerance extremism and violence. Besides Pakistan, Shima Karmani has performed in several countries including UK, USA, Germany, France, Netherlands, Spain, Italy, Norway, China, Egypt, Bahrain, Kurdistan, Indonesia, India, and Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Because of who she is and what she has accomplished, Shima Karmani was nominated as one of the 1000 peace women from across the globe in 2005. She was awarded the Shah Abdul Latif Award in 2008, the Courageous Woman Award by Pakistan Women Lawyers Association in 2009, and Acha Peace Star Award in 2012. I interviewed Shima Karmani at her home on February 19. 2013. My name is Shima Kirmani. I live in Karachi and um, basically I am um, I would like to define myself maybe as a cultural activist. Um, 
I belong to a family that migrated from uh, India in, after 1947. My father is from Lucknow, UP, and my mother's family was settled in Hyderabad, Deccan. And uh, they got married in 1948, and then they moved to Pakistan. And um, so all, all of us, we are three children. Uh, I have an older brother and I'm in the middle and I have a younger sister. All three of us are born in Pakistan. But um, uh, before I say more about myself, I just want to talk a little bit about my childhood memories of visiting India every you know, summer vacations. Um, my mother used to take all the children and we would go by train from wherever we were all the way down India to Hyderabad and uh, because my grandparents used to live there my mother's parents and we would visit them and I had such wonderful memories of spending summer there in their home and that is where I heard um, sounds of the sitar early morning I heard the sounds of the gurus, the ankle bells in the mornings when I woke up and it wasn't only that I heard these, I actually saw this happening because my mother uh, was very fond of dancing so her ustad used to come to teach her in the house. Oh, yeah. So she would learn the sitar in the house, she would learn Bharatanatyam in the house and so would my khalas, my aunts, my mother's sisters mm -hmm. who were living with my grandparents there. So this was my first exposure to, um, to um, dance and music and it was a lovely, wonderful exposure and I have wonderful memories of that and right across my grandparents' ho home uh, was my, uh, an aunt of mine lived in whose house <coughs> Talat Mahmood, the oh. famous Ghazal singer, right, yeah. used to live. And so I ha also have memories of just walking across the road and mm. sitting mm. there in their house and listening to Talat Sahab singing his Ghazals. And um, so these are thoughts that I just wanted to share with you because yeah. I think they are such right. wonderful memories. And they kind of stayed with me always. Mm. My father was um, actually uh, a commissioned officer in the British India Army. Mm. And uh, after partition, he opted for Pakistan, so he was uh, in the Pakistan army. Mm -hmm. And uh, he rose to the rank of being a brigadier. And uh, because he was in the army, we were posted in these small cantonments, the mm -hmm. military cantonments, and every two years we would move, right. you know. But, and that was a, a, a wonderful way of seeing all of Pakistan. So I've lived in small towns, in villages, and uh, lived a lot uh, in, in connection with outdoors because these small towns were really close to the villages and we had open spaces. And as children, we had this wonderful exposure to nature. And I remember that now that I see young people, what do they do in their spare time? What we used to do, we would pick flowers and dry them uh -huh. and make scrapbooks right. and you know go for long walks, climb trees, things that children don't do anymore in the right. cities, right. especially in the city of Karachi. Uh -huh. However, finally um, we settled, um, my father's last posting was in Karachi and then he chose to settle in Karachi. Um, and um, uh, uh, my father was very interested in Western classical music. Uh -huh. So from a young age, he sent all his children to learn Western classical music. I think from the age of five or six, mm. I was sent to learn how to play the piano, how to read uh -huh. the, uh, the uh, Western music. classical music. Uh -huh. And on Sundays, we would hear a lot of classical music in the home. There was this <laughs> gramophone, and he would play Beethoven and Mozart yeah. and you know the Tchaikovsky and yeah. so that was the kind of exposure that I had and I want to sh say this because I think that kind of exposure mm -hmm. gave me a lot of roots from which to you know emerge uh, uh, evolve further so this was my background and um, 
So then I, um, uh, I, then I studied in Karachi. Mm -hmm. I lived in Karachi and my high school in, or was in Karachi and I then went to an art college in London and I, got, uh, I, I did a degree in fine arts. But at the same time, as I was growing, uh, growing up and I was in school, my mother sent me to learn classical dance as well. And in mm -hmm. Karachi there was a couple... Fine, fine arts meaning painting? Fine arts meaning painting. Okay. Actually, I qualified in fine arts. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was wanting to become a painter. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so when I was about, when we shifted, moved to Karachi, mm. uh, my mother found this couple and their name was uh, they were Mr. and Mrs. Ghansham. Mm. Uh, now Mr. Ghansham was from Calcutta mm. and Mrs. Ghansham was from Manipur. Mm. So I was telling you about Mr. and Mrs. Ghansham and uh. they, they had been invited in 1958 by Sohar Vardhi to set up a dance institute in uh, in, uh, in Karachi. So uh, he set up, uh, Mr. Gansham set up this dance school mm. and uh, that's I, I joined that uh, school and that, at that time I was something like 13, 14. Mm. So I started learning with them and Mr. Gansham had been from Almora, he went on to Uday Shankar's center oh, at Almora. Yeah. Okay, okay. So that, the, the tradition that he came from was uh -huh. that tradition. Uh -huh. You know, with, at Almora, Uday Shankar had created this, uh, mod, tried to revo remake this modern Indian dance, you yeah. know. Yes. And so he, uh, so he um, revived Bharatanatyam, Odissi, Kathakali, right. Kathak. So when people ask me, what have you learned? Actually, I've learned all these forms because yeah. that's what they taught. That's yeah. what Uday Shankar yeah. had also started. Fact, so uh, the, that is how I started learning. But uh, um, then when I, as with time, I just grew more and more interested in dance. And Mr. Gansham then said that if you really want to take it up seriously, you should go to India because we have been away from from India for so long and the dance has evolved so much after partition right, actually. Yeah, yeah. You know the way uh, they revived their classical forms in, in India, it was really in the late 30s and 40s. And the government and, also increased. Yes, uh -huh. yes. So he suggested to me that go and visit India and look at the dance forms and see what you want to do. And so that's what I started doing. Mm. And that's when I went back and I wanted to learn Bharatanatyam. Mm. So I went to learn Bharatanatyam. Um, but then I I did that for about a year. But how old? How old are you now? Now, oh, that, this is I'm now. I'm talking about much later. I mean, I'd grow. I, I'd finished my education. Huh. I'd been to UK. I'd huh. done my art education. Huh. I came back. I'd started working. So I went to India and uh, I saw Bharatanatyam, and I loved it. And I said I want to learn it. So I stayed there for about. I got a visa for three months at that time and I got it extended and I stayed for another three months. Mm -hmm. I was at uh, in Delhi at a place called Bharatiya Kala Kendra mm -hmm. where my teacher was Leela Samson who mm -hmm. is now actually the principal of Kalakshetra mm -hmm. okay. in Madras. Mm -hmm. And so I learned Bharatanatyam from her and I came back but then I realized that in Pakistan there's nobody who knows Karnatak music. Right. There's nobody who can play Karnatak right. music. Yeah. And there's actually no appreciation and understanding right. of it exactly. as well. So I just thought to myself, what am I going to do with, with this? Yeah. And so I went back and I picked up Odissi. Uh -huh. And I got an ICC, an Indian Council for Cultural Relations Scholarship. Yeah. Right. And now this is 88, 89. Uh -huh. I went to India to with on the scholarship to uh, study Odyssey uh, and at that time I did Kathak as well and so I spent two three years learning these different forms in India. I found that in Odyssey uh, there was a very interesting um, merger of the north and the south. Uh -huh. You know, it has a lot of things of South India huh. and it has the North Indian music. Right. Yeah. So, and it is also the very, because it was revived on Geet Govinda, uh -huh, right. which is uh, which is poetry. Right. Uh, so I thought that, the, uh, you know, the form lends itself huh. to a lot of poetry. So now what I do is I use a lot of Urdu poetry, uh -huh. Farsi poetry and even English poetry. Uh -huh. uh, and I choreograph around it in using the forms that I know. Uh -huh. so my work is experimental and I'm trying to evolve uh, right. a dance style uh, which we here living in Pakistan right. can say that this is ours right you yeah, know yeah, because right. I think that is what is important right yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, I've learned these various forms and I want to use these forms mm -hmm. to move further right, yeah. uh, but what happened in uh, 1981 mm -hmm. uh, when Ziaullah came into power uh, 
he actually banned classical dance on stage to be performed by women. Mm -hmm. There was an ordinance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all the dancers that were here, uh, because till 71 there were also those who had come from East Pakistan mm. where there was more cultural right. of this kind mm -hmm. uh, than in the West of right. uh, uh, West Pakistan. So it's after 71 though they had gone back oh. to, uh, to what became Bangladesh oh. and those who had got, were left left the country in 1981 when oh. it got back. Oh. So from 81 onwards I was the only dancer left in Pakistan. Mm. And I decided to stay on. Mm. I said, well, it's my basic right, right to dance and who can, why should anybody stop? Right. Yeah. And so that from that point, my dance became an act of defiance, oh. became political, right. became um, um, uh, resistance. Mm. And, um, and that's how it has continued to be. Mm. And I find that interesting mm -hmm. because for me dance has become also a symbol mm -hmm. of women's resistance mm -hmm. because it's actually dance by women that is looked down upon yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I have always wondered why a Muslim male mm -hmm. when he sees a woman on stage mm -hmm. what is the thing that uh, what is the resistance that he has to the, mm -hmm. to a woman dancing why do they say a woman on dancing on stage is immoral un-Islamic, uh -huh. not acceptable. Uh -huh. you know, I think it's because he thinks that a woman who stands up on stage is saying that, well, I'm proud of my body. Uh -huh. I'm not ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm confident mm -hmm. and uh, I believe in myself. And this becomes a statement which... Of defiance. Yes. Of defiance. Of uh, male authority uh, against male authority, and it like he feels that one is, um, um, you know, standing in front of his authority mm -hmm. and saying that, well, uh, posing a challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. Though I don't think one is even thinking of. I mean, I don't think I thought uh -huh. when I started it, that is not what happened. I had thought. Uh -huh. It happened in that uh -huh. way. Yeah. But now I feel that yes. Why should we not use yeah. dance as? A, a symbol of our resistance. Yeah. I don't think I um, I can be satisfied. Uh, there is so much more that needs to be done. Uh, I've tried my best to do uh, what I can, but it's been uh, it's a small it's a very small thing that, uh, yeah. and uh, I I think um, uh, uh, presently this the way things are in Pakistan is uh, one needs to connect this with the whole. Uh, um, the political scene in Pakistan and mm. what is happening, um, uh, the extreme fundamentalism that has taken over. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, one could certainly cannot be satisfied where one is. Where one is. In fact, at presently, currently, things are probably so bad. Mm. Every day we are facing uh, uh, deaths in hundreds mm -hmm. and sectarian deaths, religious mm -hmm. intolerance, um, uh, communities being killed. Uh, it's horrible. It's uh, and so obviously to exist in this environment, uh, it becomes just a question that one has to survive from day to day. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, it's even more difficult. As a female artist, it's even more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, there's constant threat. There's mm -hmm. constant uh, f uh, fear that you know somebody is going to attack you. Mm -hmm. Somebody is going to harm mm -hmm. you, and whatever work you've achieved mm -hmm. uh, will get totally destroyed. So at the moment, what I I feel is very important for me and I want to use this opportunity to bring that to people who may be watching this video is to say that what one, what I need in Pakistan is to be able to put create an institution where these arts can survive mm -hmm. because I may not be there tomorrow, mm -hmm. but I've trained so many young people, I've trained so many dancers, actors, um, choreographers, and they need to have a space where they can flourish, where they can perform, where they can get together and create work. Mm -hmm. So what we need now is to institute, and, and no art form can survive unless it's institutionalized. Mm -hmm. and 
our state and government is not going to do it. Mm. So this is, be, is now my dream, mm. is to be able to set up mm. a space in, where I can create this kind of an institute where, because I have trained dancers, I have trained actors, mm. uh, so I have a company. I have a company of dancers, I have a company mm. of actors, and it, it needs to become a repertory company which can continue performing. But for that one needs space, one needs a kind of a platform to make this move forward, um, and I think that is what mm. I would, uh, if anybody is interested, I want people to support this uh, movement, to set up a dance and theatre institute in the city where people can come, learn, and continue to be, uh, uh, this whole movement of performing arts, becoming a means of alternative education in Pakistan. Supposing you are 18 again now, would you do anything differently or well, would you do the same thing that you done, did when you were 18? Yes, when I was 18 I was a real rebel, I was a revolutionary and I, I feel and I wish and I hope that I, if I'm 18 again I'll still be the same because hmm. I think that that is what made me what I am. My my reading and my uh, of Marxism, my understanding of Marxism, um, gave gave me the strength to be able to survive all the obstacles that I faced in my life. And uh, and I still I still believe in that. And I still believe that there will be a change. And I still believe in humanity and in in the goodness of. Uh, humankind mm. and I feel that things will change. If I did not have that, I don't think I could have. If I didn't have this belief inside me that what I'm doing is right, that I, I wasn't convinced about my work, about my art and the truth of it mm -hmm. and the power of it, uh, I don't think I could have done it. I believe that women have the power inside them. Mm. I believe that if they get in touch with that power, they can change the world. So if you are an 18-year-old daughter and she was considering her options yeah. in today's Pakistan, what advice would you give her? I would say to her, do what you believe. Do what your mind and your heart tells you to do. Mm. Not what your surrounding is forcing you to do. Um, because there's so much peer pressure, there's so many the social, socio-political conditions are so different to what I, uh, to what I want. Mm. Uh, so I would say that do what you believe. Mm. And if you believe, uh, and once you believe in it, you will be able to achieve it. Because otherwise you can't achieve what you want to do. Last question. What do you think is the status of or possibility of peace or communal harmony in Pakistan mm -hmm. at this time? Even today in Karachi, there are hundreds, there are a huge number of people who have been killed last yesterday. I mean, every morning you wake up and there's numbers are never less than 20, 25, 30, 35. Mm -hmm. so, I think we are living in times where there is such uh, a huge depression because of this. Um, so survival became primary issue yes. rather than making a long term accomplishment. Yes, I think it is very difficult to actually start planning and uh, thinking in long term. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I mean, one doesn't know if one is going to be alive tomorrow. Right. But I think civilized societies only function uh, once they believe, uh, dream in the long term mm -hmm. and uh, have policies and directions for mm -hmm. the long term. So on the one hand, one hopes and believes and dreams that in the long term things mm. will change but presently I think thing we were going through is extreme bloodshed mm. and um, uh, very sad uh, times mm. but yes I hope that it will change I think it the, the the positive thing that I see is that you see up till now we used to say oh why are people not protesting this is happening and nobody comes out there are 10 of us who come on the street and uh, 10,000 uh, 10, are not there 
But I think slowly, slowly, that is what is changing. People are, you know, because now it's hitting everyone. Mm. Every family is getting affected. And so I think people will start protesting, have started protesting. And I think once that happens, things have to change. Well, thank you very much, Shimaji. I really appreciate you taking time out at this time of day. You've been tired. <laughs> All day you've been working. Thank you, uh, Pidanji. It lot. was a pleasure, and I hope that through through you, I can get my thoughts to a, a larger number of people, um, and they know how, under what circumstances we are living and how we are managing to do what we do. Thank you. <laughs> As I told you before, I represent the Association for Communal Harmony in Asia, which is also known by its acronym ACHA, based in the U.S. state of Oregon. It is a non-profit non-political organization. Founded in 1993, ACHA aims to promote peace in South Asia and harmony among South Asians everywhere. But the realities have made us to focus our efforts primarily on India and Pakistan. During the last 20 years, we have initiated petitions, participated in and organized peace missions, conducted peace camps for youth, recognized activists, activists with awards for their meritorious efforts and brought out electronic publications. For their continued support, we thank our peace partners, particularly in India, Varanasi-based People's Vigilance Committee for Human Rights, Hyderabad-based Confederation of Voluntary Associations, and Chandigarh-based Yuv Sata. And in Pakistan, Karachi-based Pakistan Institute of Labor, Education and Research, also Karachi-based Tariq in Iswan, and Lahore-based Institute for Peace and Secular Studies. Also, commitment and dedication of our members and directors have been responsible for our accomplishments. But I am particularly grateful to three individuals who helped make Acha what it is today. They are Dr. Ingrid Schaefer, Reverend Dr. Herbert Hofer, and Kundan Rohila. Dr. Ingrid Schaefer is a retired professor of philosophy, religion, and interdisciplinary studies at the University of Science and Art of Oklahoma. For many years, at her own expense, she has been designing and maintaining websites of several humanitarian organizations, including ACHA. Reverend Dr. Herbert Hofer is emeritus Professor of Theology at Concordia University in Portland, Oregon. During many, as, during many years of his association with Acha, he has held many important positions like Director, Treasurer, Secretary and President. He continues to be a loyal and dedicated supporter of Acha. As far as Kundan Rohila is concerned, I will let her speak for herself. I'm Kundan Rohila, 
In beginning, I start. I got involved because of my husband, Pritam Rohila. But as I got to know more people, I make more friends, and we travel India and Pakistan, and I got to know more and more about the peace, how it's important, and how much people like to do it. We think, oh, this is not me, or this is not many people likes to have uh, do those things. But actually, more people likes to have a peace in the world than war in the world. So I involved in a, joined to my husband for peace camps, and I start taking some videos, and I try to see the people's ex expression, how they are interested in those talks, what my husband was giving. And I realized that many times they don't actually understand what he means. Maybe they feel he's a little too high in uh, his talk or whatever. Then I stepped in and to uh, explain to them that this is in a simple language, that this is, even though we are speaking Hindi or Urdu literally, they are not familiar with our pronounces or whatever. So I explained to them and they got really interested what we are talking about and they are really enjoyed the talk and they try to put in their regular life. Top of that, I really got impressed the way they are doing peace work, putting their life in dangerous, and still they are doing welfare for others. And it's amazing that how much those young children, young means under 25, and they are doing such a wonderful job. I'm really impressed and I'm amazed for this work. Thank you.